Good evening. It's a great pleasure to be uh, here at the Estonian Political Forum uh, for once uh, online, remotely, and, and not uh, in the beautiful framework uh, of the Palace Hotel in Estoril. But it's so great that this uh, splendid conference uh, is up uh, and provides all of us uh, with a wonderful opportunity to think about the big themes and big challenges uh, of our time. Uh, I'm particularly happy to be here uh, as the host uh, of this session, uh, which is typically lunch, uh, but alas, you know, we, uh, it's, it's going to be a virtual uh, lunch, uh, so to say the session is entitled uh, to Luigi Inaudi because a few years ago when uh, Professor Joao Espada uh, asked me about, you know, who will be a great Italian uh, after whom we shall name uh, a session at the Estonian Political Forum, thinking about Churchill and Adenauer, <laughs> clearly the name of Luigi Einaudi uh, came to mind. Uh, he was president of our uh, republic, uh, but you know, far more importantly, he was an economist uh, and uh, a journalist for uh, all of his lifetime. He was uh, the most respected person uh, in the Italian economic debate, the teacher of many, and in some sense, uh, the teacher of economics to a nation uh, with his wonderful crystal clear columns uh, that he produced basically over more than 50, uh, than 50 years. Uh, tonight, uh, our speaker is His Excellency Ambassador Carlo Formosa, uh, but the chair of our discussion is Professor Angelo Petroni. Uh, Professor Petroni uh, now teaches at the University of Rome. La Sapienza is also the Secretary General of the Aspen Institute uh, in Rome. Uh, um, he's also um, a, a great uh, connoisseur, and I may say so uh, in, a, in a purely intellectual sense, a true admirer and fan uh, of Luigi Naudi. And for many years, Professor Petroni actually uh, was the editor of Biblioteca della Libertà, which is a journal published by uh, Centro uh, Einaudi in Turin. Uh, you know, just to give you a sense of the development of the classical liberal movements in Italy, uh, Biblioteca della Libertà was actually started by the namesake of my institute, uh, Bruno Leoni, in the 1960s. Uh, back then, it was uh, really some kind of magazine, but it was turned into a real academic journal, uh, basically uh, by Professor Petroni uh, during his editorship. Uh, so I'm very happy uh, to leave him the floor uh, to introduce Ambassador Formosa and the very important subject of tonight, which has to do with threats and opportunities for the West in the post-COVID-19 world. Angelo, you're mute. Thank you. Uh, I thank Professor and Holt, Holt, his young man, Alberto Mingardi, for this, for his chair, for this presentation. Uh, Professor Mingardi is doing an excellent job in Italy, not just in Italy, worldwide, for the promoting classical liberalism, which was the position of Luigi Einaudi, one of the giants of the 20th century on the same level as Adenauer or Churchill, perhaps uh, less, uh, less political, more intellectual, but one of the men who did rebuild Europe after the Second World War. And I would like to remind that Professor Mingardi just became the secretary of the Montpellerin Society, a highly respected society created by higher kind of Luigi Naudi and Popper and the Madariaga in the 1947. Uh, it's a pleasure today to host, to be with Professor Mingardi in presenting uh, Professor, uh, Ambassador Carlo Formosa with the Italian ambassador to Portugal. Uh, by the way, uh, Aspen Institute Italy is, uh, is hosted in Palazzo Lancelotti de Torres in Rome, in Piazza Navona. And the builder of the palace was an archbishop, the Torres, 
in the mid of 16th century was sent by the Pope as an ambassador to Portugal. And that is quite interesting. And, uh, is in pictures in the palace. If anybody of, of you will come to Rome, please come to Piazza Navona, Palazzo Lancelotti, and we'll see the links between Italy and Portugal and Spain, because the Torres came from Malaga and on following Charles V. So uh, Ambassador Formosa has a spectacular curriculum, and he, uh, he made is it did service it did serve in so many different positions internationally and he had also some position more uh, uh, managerial position as it was for several years in Fimeccanica, which is one of the highest uh, company in Italy for technology as the head of external relations and international relations so he has a wide view about the world not just the view of the diplomat, even the, the view of somebody who did uh, manage important international business relations. He will speak about, uh, as Alberto reminded, about the post-COVID world. Post, let us hope it's post-COVID world. There will be a post-COVID anyway. But, you know, you have to prepare for the reconstruction while the disaster is there. This was the last solo of Luigi Gaudi in 1943, in the time when the war was still ravaging Italy, Einaudi was creating plans for the reconstruction. You, don't, you have to plan for reconstruction while the disaster is there. You don't have to wait the disaster is over for planning and thinking to reconstruction. So there is still this intellectual, very strong link between what they now they did, and the, the argument of uh, Ambassador Formosa's speech. Ambassador Formosa, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Petroni, and thank you to Professor Mingardi for the world of introduction. It's my pleasure to participate to this very, very stimulating event. And I'm obviously very glad to, uh, very grateful to the Instituto de Studios Politicos de la Universidad Católica for having me here and uh, uh, for asking me to contribute as a speaker to this uh, uh, common thinking. Uh, the, the aim of my paper is, is to give a contribution to the ongoing appraisals of the post-COVID scenarios in relation to the role of the so-called West and specifically to the potential of the European Union in countering global instability and new threats against the safeguard of Western models and values. Future historians will trace comparably large effect on the current coronavirus pandemic, the challenges figuring them ahead of time. And this is perhaps the greatest contribution political scientists can make now figuring out those effects ahead of time, trying to define the future of relationship between states in the post-COVID era and the free market. The Great Depression gave rise to the New Deal. The Second World War gave rise to the Marshall Plan. COVID-19 is causing decline in employment and economic activity on a greater scale than the Great Depression. And in US only has already caused the loss of American lives larger than any war since 1945. Might not the pandemic provoke comparably constructive responses? As Francis Fukuyama recently wrote, the pandemic has been a global political stress test. Most of the phenomena uh, we are facing now, however, have, just, have been just accelerated by COVID-19 but they were already in play in the international system. The risk of wider economical inequalities, disinformation, the loss of faith in liberal democracies, the growing hostility between major players within the international community are not an effect of the pandemic emergency. Maybe, as Haas predicts, the pandemic will accelerate history rather than reshape it. But as Professor Petroni just remarked, it would be a mistake to act on such an assumption. While I speak, 
We have little idea how or when the pandemic will lift, still less when the economy will rebound, nor when can be sure how credit and blame will be distributed on which and which conclusion society may draw. As far as the latter issue is concerned, the blame to be distributed, one of the main questions remains to be appraised is how the crisis will affect the global balances, and in particular, the strategic rivalry between the United States and China. Many observers stress that American neo-isolationism, growing Sino-US competition, the difficulties of the European project, and the resurgence of geopolitical activism in some global and regional countries are all symptoms of a transformation already happening. And that this shift is already causing an increase in global instability and new threats against the safeguard of Western models and values. Looking at the present system of the international order, a growing number of observers maintain that we are already enter an environment that reminds us uh, the one of the Cold War, a rivalry that certainly and completely differs from the last in terms of the opposing side and has as far as the field of conflict is concerned, but still with one clear sign of consistency related to the previous. The Western model of democracy appeared to be somehow under siege and that the challenge would come from the model itself of the autocratic regime. Where is the confrontation being conducted that would threaten Western democracy? The new fields of conflict are virtual, but their effects are very real on the stability of the West. The race for technological dominance, cybersecurity, the fight against propaganda, fake news are new battlefields. In the opinion on may, of many historians, the West is already facing a structural crisis. In fact, it is no coincidence that the title of the latest Munich Security Conference was Westlessness. In that, in other words, a global retreat of the defining values of the West, even for the states that are part of it. More than a geographical definition, the West has been seen as a community that identifies itself in a system of values, respect for freedom and human rights, rule of law, market economy, and democracy. Without this value, without these strongholds of social political coexistence, the notion itself of the West loses its significance. Certainly, within the West, differences have always existed. The social European model, for instance, is very different from the North American one. At the same time, the system of values of Japanese society, a state that is indeed part of the West, is different from the British one. Nevertheless, over the time, convergences overcame distances, giving birth to a united group of allies. Within this group, transatlantic links also built on the awareness that Europe owed to the US for the help it received in the aftermath of the Second World War play an irreplaceable role. Transatlantic alliance has been essential to guarantee security and stability in Western Europe. Over the time, the relationship also evolved, beginning an alliance between equals who identify themselves in a shared system of values, despite the due differences. In recent times, the Western cohesion appeared to have suffered a retreat. The increase of socioeconomic inequalities between Western nations had implications on a political and economic level, where changes and stra of strategies and a more heterogeneous view and application of democratic principle at the national level have contributed to open some fissures within this block of countries. This consideration guides us to a question. What defines the West today? Liberal democracy is at the center of the construction of the West definition. And this it is, if not for any further reason, that because of all, all, all the principles associated to Western tradition, freedom, human rights, rule of law, market economy, are essential precondition of liberal democracy. The widest divergence lately observed in democratic models adopted by the West and the external threat these models tend to face conduct us to a second question. Is democracy as we know it under siege? Here are some figures who help us in focusing the question. In the 90s of the last century, the number of democratic states increased significantly. It was something that Samuel Huntington called 
the third wave of democratization. This led in 2001 to the majority of the world population living in states considered democratic, notwithstanding the due distinctions. However, since that year, the process of democratization has regressed. The number of autocracies and the drift towards autocratic regimes has been increasing. Now, for the first time since 2001, most people are back living in systems that cannot be defined fully democratic. In recent months, the COVID-19 has contributed to encourage autocratic drifts in many countries but only accelerating and worsening an ongoing process. The narrative, which some of these states have tried to disseminate, argue that autocracies would be able to respond more efficiently to emergencies. This has not proved to be true, and Italy is perhaps one of the most obvious demonstrations. In fact, democracies have reacted better. Freedom of the press has not prevented information sharing. Response measures have been more effective and public health in the European Union has saved thousands of lives. Yet, according to a recent survey conducted by the University of Siena and the International Affairs Institute, 73% of Italians believe that liberal democracies have shown a limit in managing the emergency. We are faced with a problem of perception, but maybe not only that. COVID-19 has exacerbated the contrast between democracies and autocracies, and the latter have something taken, sometimes taken the opportunity to destabilize or exert greater influence on the former. In this scenario of what has been called the siege of Western democracy, European countries are at the forefront. The EU has the fundamental importance in shaping the future of its countries and in preserving the future of the liberal international order. The more Europe succeeds in nourishing its democracies, the greater will be the hopes for the affirmation of rights and values so dear to us in the international framework. If this were not the case, the international order will return to pure power politics with direct repercussions on the stability of democracies. COVID-19 has thrown a global challenge to the defense of public health and its catastrophic consequences for the economy have revealed a wide range for, of democratic dilemmas, particularly between globalism and nationalism, between public health and civil liberties, and between political and technocratic governments. Democratic states are summoned to respond to this challenge. To save itself and the, the democratic legacy of the West, Europe, its states and its citizens have uh, only one way to go. The EU must equip itself with the means to protect its citizens. Over time, the coronavirus is proving to be, in the end, of a, a, selective, virus, a selective virus, cap capable of affecting people in different ways, depending on their socioeconomic status. This is because the crisis, initially a health crisis, will now be mainly economic. The outcome of the competition between democracies and autocracies is so far, is so far, is far from obvious, sorry. One can go so far as to say that it's not simply the state that has made a comeback. It is above all the authoritarian state, which especially in today's crisis is able to decide and act quickly with a firm hand. This is anything but a, but a new topic. For years, we have witnessed an ongoing challenge between the fragilities of our democracies and the strength and long-term planning power of authoritarian countries. Democratic societies are more fragile, is this true, but the freedom on which they are based ensure an unparalleled source of innovation. The pandemic granted new fronts of siege to the autocracies, but allowed the European democracies to equip themselves with new tools to resist. Resilience is, after all, a key world why all EU countries are committed to define their recovery plan for the next generation of our continent. In the ability to make resilience and free market dialogue lies one of the great challenges for the future. 
the pandemic has strengthened the power of the state in its more traditional role of protecting society from external threats. By the effect of COVID-19 impose an additional role of response in setting the condition to relaunch and protect the economy. In fact, without an economic recovery, people's lives will soon be in danger again. And with it, the democratic stability itself will be in danger. This consideration brings me to appraise another element of investigation that was increasingly under scrutiny on behalf of political analysts. What are the changes occurred in the role of the state and what are the possible adjustments the state is experiencing in relation to its citizens? For decades, despite some differences across countries, the state with its rules, taxes, and public administration has always appeared as the sworn enemy of the society's healthy forces. As Reagan and Thatcher put it, the state was the, state was the beast that had to be starved. Less taxes, less bureaucrats, more market. In this vein, state aids were seen as a poison, whilst nationalization and state companies were deemed as a taboo. In a matter of few months, the perception has been overturned. The state now tells us what we, can, what we can and what we cannot do in daily briefings, what we can do even within our family and social ties. The National Health System, uh, Health Service is uh, here of the day, even in countries that had almost dismantled it, or in the ones that never had actually. State aid and the nationalization of entire sector are advocated even by former market gurus. And basic income is now the tool that everyone is after. To help companies to support families, to revamp national health system, states are invited to spend. Thus accumulating, thus accumulating debts with seemingly no regrets. Even International Monetary Fund, for decades, the true defender of the austerity policies, seems to agree today. Is this well a part of the siege of Western democracy? Does this consequently mean that the siege of capitalism is ongoing? In fact, the global financial crisis has reopened the academic debate on the respective role for the markets and governments in stabilizing a faltering economy. This is now increasing agreement. This is now, yes, increasing agreement on the idea that the new consensus had gone too far in limiting monetary and especially fiscal policy. But a more fundamental debate should be open on the role of governments in ensuring long-term balances growth, especially in an increasing globalized economy. The unregulated globalization that started in the 1970s brought about many unsustainable imbalances, of which inequality is one of the most dangerous for the future of liberal well, democracies. We therefore need to reconsider the role of the government as an actor capable of planning over the long term in order to correct distortion and to ensure stable and sustainable growth. It goes without saying that in the current environment of pressure on public finances, fiscal reform will be the defining issue of the next decade in terms of reducing inequality, and endowing the state with the means to pursue long-term policies. This also would mean that Europe would need a change in the political and economic culture that dominated the European construction since the Maastricht Treaty. In any way, the victory against inflation, which was considered as the condition sine qua non to build a good economy, ended in the worst crisis since 1929. And on a similar note, the elite could be led to perceive what some economists are putting forward. In this regard, the Italian G20 presidency will explore no new policy thinking and acting through the new approaches to economic. It is evident that G20 public debts are expected to rise and that the focus will be on investment. We need to look for different sources in order to finance investments. 
it would be risky if a new shock arises. Each country should therefore improve its performance in regulatory policy by firstly removing investment bar barriers. This last consideration brings me to what I perceive as an element of certainty in uh, the appraisal of future evolution of the present geopolitical framework. We will we'll all lose if solidarity and coordination do not prevail within and between states. And indeed, the first lesson we learn from the crisis is that the competitive dynamics induced by the emergency have reduced the efficacy and the effectiveness of the national response to the pandemic. We are all facing the most global challenging generation. All countries are facing unprecedented threats at the same time from both the health and now economic perspective and soon in the social and possibly political sphere too. If the narrative, my country first prevails, if everyone keeps adopting uncoordinated measure, we will most certainly head towards difficult times in responding to the spiral of new waves of infection with the long-term health and economic effects and most probably devastating consequences that are easy to figure out. Taking care of uh, the Iket Nung, it's obviously our top priority, but what happens in Asia, Africa, India, or even in our respective neighbor countries is equally important. It's together that we must avoid the worst case scenarios everywhere. As it was already stressed by some observers, we should do this not only out of empathy, but out of selfishness too. This is particularly true for Europe, whose members are in between a traditional state and federation. Social, economic and political interconnections are so deep in Europe that any lack of coordination, any selfishness risks jeopardizing a 70 years old long integration process. In this sense, extraordinary steps have been taken in Brussels in the recent months much remains to be done in order to finally make those decisions become effective and therefore contribute to strengthen the European project and show European cohesion that is essential to save the common democratic heritage. The real test for Europe will not only be the defense of its international democratic reliance and of its socioeconomic aptitude, the challenge will certainly be as well to enhance common policies able to counter the effect of the crisis, but even more to prove itself to be able to fully protect all rights, civil, political, economic, and social. Therefore, the challenge will certainly concern the role that EU will be able to assume in the international scenario, which it, it, where it will have to take on the demanding task of promoting those values, which have been at the basis of the international liberal order for decades and which are still the pillar of its democracies. Indeed, those same values are precisely the one that define and identify what we call the West. Building a better future is possible only if we work together, united in a global community of intent forged on the spirit of cooperation and solidarity. The issue of multilateralism has been part of debates and acts of over the first two decades of this century, and not only in the discussion between academics and researchers, but also and above all in the relations between states. This happens in a context where globalization established itself as a difficult phenomenon to manage and is driven by dig digitalization that accelerates in every field of society and of human knowledge, the sharing of processes, news, ideas, and behaviors. It was thus a knowledge that the most effective way to achieve one's national interest, to regain world peace, to achieve economic and social growth and technological process, progress inevitably involved effective cooperation between states. We are also aware of the content to which this approach has also been crucial for the European continent, 
We are also aware of the extent to which it simplified the work of the founding fathers of the Union, who were committed to reconciliation and smoothened throughout the path of integration that has guaranteed and continues to guarantee the longest period of, for peace and prosperity that Europe has ever experienced. A system, the multilateral one, that in these 75 years has never ceased to foster the flourishing of numerous complex and articulated further opportunities for cooperation, as the United Nations system has done likewise in parallel. In particular, the Italian Republic has found in the process of European integration the tool to have a say in the response to the challenge that have arisen in the past 60 years. Today, even more, Europe's choice in favor of the rights of the person and minorities, its commitment to peace and democracies can make the difference in a world filled with temptation to return to conflict and to build new walls. A Europe capable of being able to play this role in a guarantee that tension and contrast can be channeled in the direction of profitable solution for all actors. A guarantee of robust anchoring to multilateralism is the only alternative to zero-sum world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Uh, we do have um, quite a few minutes for a, for a discussion, and I think uh, questions will be um, you know, showering us quite soon, given uh, I mean, the, the width, uh, the extent uh, of the discussion we may be taking. You uh, put many uh, subjects on the table from, you know, the challenges of fiscal consolidation after the pandemic um, to uh, basically, and uh, I would like, if I may, to, uh, you know, uh, so now put some questions to both you and Professor Petronio about that. Uh, you started from the nature of the West. Uh, somehow the West is uh, something we intuitively grasp, uh, but it, it is also quite uh, an elusive uh, concept. Um, I, I was thinking of, uh, of a recent paper by Professor Petroni published a few months ago in the uh, Revista de Occidente in, in Spain. Uh, where well, one of the things he discusses uh, is the centrality of the idea of progress for the justification of modern science. And, you know, somehow the idea of progress is also central uh, for a justification for the underpinning uh, of the West uh, as we know it. So I would like to ask you um, how we are doing and how may we do uh, on that metrics after the pandemic. Clearly, the pandemic is fostering lots of hopes in science, uh, but you know some of these hopes may turn to be illusions, uh, and we may end up uh, with a very strong, uh, you know, blowback uh, when it comes into the public perception of science and scientists. And still, you know, our, our sense of, of progress, and particularly uh, scientific progress, to me, uh, looks like really one of the pillars of the uh, Western identity, if we uh, need to come up uh, with a concept like that. So either one of you, I don't know who wants to start. Please, Buffalo, please first. Oh, no, please. <laughs> Please. It's been uh, also uh, named the, the, the book that you, you wrote on this, uh, on this subject, so that please, I'm very, very looking forward to hear what's going to be your response. Thank you so much. Well, uh, I think if you look, uh, uh, Alberto and I, uh, we had a, a friend who died a few months ago, Deepak Lal, an Indian economist very prominent international economist at UCLA and before in Oxford, who wrote a book, a book as an Indian, The West and the Rest. It's very, very, very nice. Uh, which means that the West 
uh, has been defined mostly as what is not the rest. And for many years, we went on on this definition and concept. So we know we didn't have definitions, but the, we know the, the West, we know the West was, was, not, was not the rest, was not India, was not, even if India is a complicated country, of course, uh, was not China, was not Korea, uh, was not Japan, even if Japan, you know, is half a German nation, as anybody knows Japan may say. Um, uh, the commercial code, as you know, of Japan from the 19th century is the German commercial code, by the way. So hybridations has been a contamination everywhere in the world since uh, at least a couple of centuries. But today, of course, facing the issues Ambassador Formosa said about the differences between democratic and non-democratic countries, of course, we have, we have been brought to reconsider what we mean by West, who, who we are in some sense. Uh, uh, you know, it's, there are several ways for doing this. One way is that of individual rights. Constitutionalism since the 17th century and the idea of inalienable rights. But the second route is that of scientific knowledge. Uh, this is something which is not so much studied in universities and around, uh, and it may, it, it, it may seem a, as a minor uh, 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 topic, but it's not minor at all. At the same time, when you had constitutionalism in England rising with John Locke, you had also the right to knowledge, the freedom of people to know. And the argument or the label was, Man can be free, can, can know, then they can be free. That freedom, personal freedom, societal freedom, depends from a freedom of research. Today, of course, fa facing this pandemic, we realize how little money we spend in the Western countries for basic research. If we had spent more money in basic research in the past, a vaccine today will not have come in one year or two years, it will have come much, much quicker. And basic research or fundamental research or pure science is a typical Western value. Uh, today, you have excellent scientists in, in China, you have in India, you have every, everywhere in Pakistan, in Iran, you have excellent scientists. But the idea that pure knowledge or abstract knowledge is a value in itself, is a good Western value, which in this moment could be unifying, in my opinion, value in times, troubled times, as Ambassador Formosa reminded, we are about new uh, neo-Jacksonian views in the United States or uh, uh, not nation. Uh, a great thinker of the 20th century, Ludwig von Mises, distinguish it clearly between nation and nationalism. They are two completely different concepts. Nation means your identity and people need identity. Nationalism means you are closing your nation to other nations. And uh, as classical liberals, we are in favor of nations, not in favor of nationalism. And science may be a, 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 a strong glue for keeping together, not just the the West, but also the rest, or that part of the rest that we cherish a lot. Uh, I finish, uh, Ambassador uh, Formosa reminded that in these times, nobody claims anymore, anymore for fiscal restraints or fiscal discipline or any kind of similar things. Well, this is true, but you know, the, probably this is inev inevitable, but there will be a price to pay for this in the in the future. You know, it, Italy, the Italian it, debt, public debt of Italy, raised from 123 percent to 160 percent in one year. Somebody said that this pandemic is like a war. There is a difference. After the Single World War, all the public debt were destroyed. <laughs> so. The world came after the war with, no, with zero public debt. Uh, people who had bonds, of course, were not very happy for this. 
but we could restart our economies in the West on the basis of the fact that public debts were made zero or sensibly reduced. By the way, the Germany renied its own public debt, Italy no. So Italy paid its own public debt before the war at very discount rates, by the way, in some sense. So, uh, and France did the same. So today we have to consider the present situation, how to escape this awful situation, but we have to think to the future, where this enormous amount of public debt, which was created everywhere in Europe, uh, in the United States too, and in other countries too, can be reabsorbed in the future. And that is something that I'm glad I'm not an economist, I'm a philosopher, so I don't have to provide the solution, but I know the problem is there. And we have, we have to be conscious the problem is there. So coming out of pandemics, coming out of the crisis is important, but we have to make a new Bretton Wood. I don't know what, what we mean, but obviously there will be a new economic international order which must be created after the pandemics. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, if I may just... Uh... We have a connection problem. Uh, uh... Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Oh, okay. Sorry, no, because there is an incoming call. Uh, sorry. Uh, yes, now I can see you. So, uh, yes, the, the idea was that uh, what defines West and uh, regarding the debt uh, is it's very tempting to follow the, 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 the system of uh, ex excluding those who uh, somehow do not uh, uh, belong to, uh, to a group that gives the, uh, uh, the uh, the feeling that you are in instead of out. It's still the, I also mentioned the, the fact that there are so uh, so many participants to, I mean, uh, member of this uh, group of allies that have completely different features in terms of culture and uh, of reference of, uh, of, uh, of uh, economic uh, system. The, the thing is that uh, uh, to me, there are few clear signs that are quite uh, that define quite quite well what is uh, uh, the what is uh, the way to identify this community, which is uh, uh, normally the respect of human rights. Uh, there are common features of respecting system of uh, uh, rule of law. Uh, also, that is quite uh, quite. Uh, typical of, uh, of uh, the countries who belong to this, to this group. Uh, but uh, uh, market economy is uh, also uh, something that is, uh, is, is part of it. So when you refer to, uh, to, uh, to India and, uh, and somehow uh, Iran and to the scientist community and to the possibility to participate to the overcoming of this emergency, there is still, I mean, a sense of difference between who is belonging to uh, which group. And uh, in, uh, in, uh, as far as the debt is concerned, my, my paper was uh, uh, showing that uh, what is, has been the change of the, of the history of the role of the state and uh, Alas, we do have another problem of connection. What has uh, somehow overturned a, a... Did you lose the connection? Yes, we did. Hello? Ah, no, because it's, some, somebody's trying to call me and distracting me. <laughs> so uh, the, the, the debt is, uh, is, uh, is definitely something that has to be kept under control, but uh, in, in, for the time being, there is a... A, an acceptance of the, of the fact that uh, what was the, the previous philosophy of keeping the balance between expenditure and, uh, and, uh, 
and that is somehow has, has, has been threatened, has been overcome. It's not anymore as it used to be a few months ago. Something, it was a revolution that happened in the European Union and definitely is going to have an impact, not only the European states, but also the, all the G G20 members. So that is, uh, is something that we definitely are going to deal with. But the problem is precisely to go to what is the need now, uh, what is we need to do in order to avoid that the basis of what we define the West, those values that are defining the group can be put under threat because of the lack of ability to, to, to save the typical relationship of the Western relationship between uh, the state and its citizens and to allow to protect them from a uh, deterioration of their social social uh, condition. And this is uh, the reason why it should be changed, the approach of what is needed for the state to be done in order not to replace what is the, uh, the, the typical activity of the, uh, of the uh, market system, but just to create the, uh, the premises for the uh, relaunching of the economy without, but also with the, uh, with the care to what is the extent of the debit that is, uh, is uh, this, in, in, uh, this activity of spending implies. So I totally agree with what uh, Professor Petroni remarked. But unfortunately, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, something that is happening and is, uh, we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, censor it. We do have two questions, uh, and uh, <clears throat> I'd like to start with this one, which is perhaps the one uh, more targeted to Ambassador Formosa, and, and then I think we have a, we have a wider one, I hope uh, Professor Petroni can also uh, answer to. So the question is from uh, Andre Azevedo Alves, uh, who's professor uh, in, in, in Porto and uh, also one of the pillars of the uh, Estoril Political Forum. Uh, he asks, how do you see European relations with China uh, after COVID-19? I think, you know, the, the um, idea is that the question would be answered quite I lost it. By uh, sorry. Sorry. Sorry, I, I lost you for a while. I don't know what this... Uh, uh, in the last five do minutes... Uh, uh, Europe-China relationship after mm. COVID-19. Yeah. So what, what about the... Uh, how, you see that? Uh, how can you um, picture them evolving? Well, that's, uh, that's very, very uh, interesting, but very difficult question to answer to. It's, uh, it's I mean, this, uh, this confrontation, this rivalry is, uh, is, uh, is ongoing and is not, uh, is not, has been only just uh, in certain extent highlighted in specific way by the uh, inception of the, of the COVID-19. Uh, but is uh, it's, it's precisely the, the, the environment where the confrontation probably is between the two systems and its effects, especially the technological dominance, which is uh, the field, of, the battlefield that uh, I was referring to, uh, is uh, the, uh, what history has proven that when we get to this kind of, uh, of uh, level of confrontation, uh, the uh, multilateralism and uh, dialogue is the, is the way that has always ensured a way out. And uh, the, the uh, use, again, of these tools that have, that have uh, uh, contributed so much to the diffusing of, uh, of uh, tension also in the past uh, is probably going to be the, uh, the, uh, the tool to be used this, this time as well. And this is the one. to contribute to, to overcome even, even worse conditions. 
I, I wouldn't, um, I don't so, I, I couldn't hear if you were referring to a war. Obviously, the war is the simplification of the concept that it's a confrontation, a rivalry. It's, uh, it's uh, some historians I see that are, and, uh, and so, uh, analysts are using more and more the term, this, uh, this narrative of, uh, of the new Cold War. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, a, 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 com a, a completely different thing, but still there, are, there, are, there is a field of confrontation that might be, uh, uh, has to be managed and has to, be, has to have a governance that is going to be easier to find um, on a more wide environment that is the, the bilateral one. Thank you. We do have uh, four questions, so I'm going to be doing something uh, quite um, quite bizarre, which is I will read and summarize them to you in order to have uh, the two of you addressing them in the very short time we do have. <coughs> Sorry. The first one is from Joao Sobido Costa was asking if um, there is really there an alternative to liberal democracy in the world. So I think his question has a little bit of the end of history flavor, uh, if you like, if you like to say so. And we do have uh, two questions um, about the European Union. So <clears throat> one question really asks, if uh, the crisis is necessarily going to be a victory uh, of the European Union, or if perhaps, you know, uh, the crisis is bound to uh, underlying differences between different countries and foster uh, conflict in the longer run. Uh, the other question uh, from our uh, splendid uh, Ost and Elp, uh, Raquel, um, is about the wide variety uh, of anti-COVID-19 measure uh, that we see displaying today. So different countries are dealing uh, with the pandemic on the one end and the economy and the rule of law on the other end in very, very difficult uh, way. So, uh, I mean, does uh, somehow the, the pandemic uh, put everybody on their own. And what we're actually seeing is not a convergence, but a divergence uh, of different uh, models of, of Western uh, nation states. Uh, the last one, which is uh, related instead uh, with um, um, our discussion about fiscal problems, uh, is from Joao Freitas, who's asking, what do you think uh, of the opinion of former Chancellor Saeed Javid, uh, who thought that the recovery after COVID-19 was to be based on lower taxes and not on QE. So uh, it's quite a lot. Uh, we have five minutes. Uh, so I'd like to ask you first, Ambassador Formosa and then Professor Petroni to uh, provide some uh, food for thought uh, to our listeners. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I think that I lost a little bit some the first part of the question, but uh, I mean, going to the last one, I mean, lower taxes or what is going to be the, the best mean in order to overcome the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, I think that uh, the most important thing is to have uh, a, a common strategy, I mean, if you are talking about Europe. Uh, it's not a, a, an option that can be made that, individually by each state, but it should be something uh, decided in a, a coordinated way. That is the only possibility because, uh, I mean, we, we saw already at the beginning, during the first wave, during the emergency of the, of the, of the first spreading, uh, that, uh, that uh, uncoordinated uh, reactions are, uh, are a recipe for, uh, for, uh, for difficult uh, results I mean, very very not not constructive and the same is true as far as the uh, fiscal policy and the ability to 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 find the means the financial means to 
counter this uh, uh, economic uh, uh, situation that we are facing, that has been switched from a, from a health one to an economic one. And again, which can have uh, uh, a, a consequence on the basis, on the pillar that sustains the system of liberal democracy. And that is the reason why there is this, this, a strategic uh, importance on the way we'll find to reply in a coordinated way. As far as the convergence of divergence within the Europe, uh, within Europe, uh, I, I I think that it's uh, it's again uh, uh, maybe I did not listen well to the question, but it's somehow uh, is the same the same question that uh, that uh, was uh, within the last one. Uh, I. I don't know if it was uh, on uh, uh, regarding politics or economy, uh, considering that I'm not an economist as well. Uh, concerned with the rule of law, generally speaking, and the anti-pandemic measures. Yeah, that, that's, that is exactly the point, that the temptation that uh, by, by uh, just uh, uh, deciding in a very, with a free hand, what has to be, uh, the, what is considered to be uh, the best for the society is, uh, is something that also uh, threatened the concept of, uh, of uh, liberal democracy. There is a, there is a point where I mean, it's the, the, uh, the, the liberty, the freedom of, uh, of each individual has to be, uh, to, to, to stay safe in order to uh, allow the main feature of this kind of community to survive also to this uh, to the adoption of the policies to to uh, to uh, counter this threat this is uh, this is uh, the uh, exactly the point because it's very it's, it's very easy to enter to to decide this kind of uh, of, uh, of of reaction but then it's, it's it can, might be easy, uh, it might be a little bit more difficult to abandon them. Thank you. Professor Petroni, uh, are you uh, likewise thinking that we're going to be getting out of this uh, with a more integrated uh, Europe? Well, it depends what you mean by integrated Europe. I mind you that in the Lisbon Treaty, there were already powers of European Union concerning pandemics. There were some powers which have not been exerted, by the way. If you go to read there, uh, there are power of coordinations, power of soft coordination, but anywhere there were powers about catastrophes. And this is a catastrophe. A European Union didn't act in this field. Why it didn't act, why each state had its own reaction is a matter of course of inquiry, is a matter of Oh, well, I don't know why. Uh, an ambassador knows more than me why European Union didn't decide to do something coordinated about pand these pandemics. But the power are still there. And so uh, what I suggest is that uh, some action is taken on the basis of what the European Union can do now, not changing the treaties, not in, in the future and so on. And I will like to, since we are running out of time, make an homage to my good friend, right. Joao Espada, who is a wonderful political philosopher. We believe, we believe it to live in, a, in the world of John Locke. We were brought back to the world of uh, Thomas Hobbes. <laughs> we are an Obesian world today, where the problem is is to survive, but when you survive, individual rights are put in second in second place in comparison to common safety, and people are ready to sell themselves to a tyrant, let me say, benevolent dictator, as they say in welfare economics, who is ready to take care of you. And this is this is obvious. It's happened all the times. Uh, humanity has seen this. Uh, shrinking and enlarging individual rights according to times. This goes back to the whole the Roman law. I remind you the famous statement, principle of public law in Rome, et provide ante consules. 
In times of crisis, the consuls had full powers. They had to revert these powers to the Senate when the emergency was over. Uh, Julius Caesar decided not to give them the, the powers back to the Senate, and they, he had problems, of course, because the senators didn't agree, and they killed him. So these alternates between more freedom and more safety and how to shift. Uh, we are still in the issue, in my opinion, still in the Obesian world. We have to go back to the Lockean world because liberal democracies cannot survive with special powers. Uh, uh, the situation in Italy, I would like to send to Ambassador Formosa a small paper I did for this, for the International Association of Public Administrations, how the pandemics was managed in Italy. Obviously, obviously you had in, in Italy a concentration of powers and a shifting from legislative power to administrative power, which is unprecedented in Italian Republican history. In some sense, this was unavoidable. The same was doing a bit everywhere in Europe, you know, with difference. Look to France, for example. But in France, the love administration though, is not a problem. But we have to go back to a more liberal world, to, to the world of individual rights. And I, I think the European Union will get more powers out of these pandemics. This is my opinion. But uh, I have a view of Europe, which was the view of Luigi Einaudi, a federalist Europe, but a liberal federalist Europe, which has some differences with the Jean Monnet Europe. So uh, my wishes is, are that we shall have more Europe, but a more liberal Europe, which means individual rights, markets, and similars. While there is a tendency today in Europe to say that this pandemic has proven the fact that the markets have to be restrained. Uh, there is a wonderful paper by Luigi Einaudi about the relationships between the state and the economy. And they said, claiming that the free market economists are against the state is like claiming that some astronomers are against some kind of stars. This is not true. You need the state. It depends which kind of state you have which the limits are. In these times, you see an expansion of the state that was unavoidable. And the problem is how to reverse, how to come back to a situation where the state keeps its own role, is not expanding. You were involved with Film Mechanica, you know, which is a wonderful company. They are a member of Aspen Institute Italy, by the way, so I'm grateful to Film Mechanica uh, for, the, for the support. And it's obvious that the, the company making weapons and other uh, defense equipment has a strong presence of the state. But now the state in Italy is expanding everywhere. They are buying hotels, they are buying everything, every kind of things because of the crisis. I understand why my friend Palermo is doing this. Uh, uh, you increase the public debt and you expand the hand of the state. I understand this is. I remember you that during, during the Second World War at the end in 1945, 60% of GDP of the United States was taken by the state. Before the war was around 15%. Obviously, when you have a war, you don't build any more cars, you build uh, tanks. We are in a similar situation. Now, uh, that's probably necessary, but we have to think how to go back from this situation because an economy with such a large presence of the state is not an economy which may guarantee on the long run, medium or long run uh, 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 growth. Uh, we have quite a good experience about that. And so probably we raise it taxes because public debt is a, is a tax ambassador, as you know. Uh, we, you call it a public debt, but it's a tax, it's a tax on the future. And we have to consider how to go back to a more sustainable public debt and more sustainable taxes. Otherwise, we shall be Europe shall will be outplaced by the United States, by Canada, by other parts in the world. But I am not an economist, so this is just an ideological position. 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Petroni. If I may add just a word, I think the other problem we do see these days is that uh, the pandemic, by definition, is intertwined uh, really with a myriad of knowledge problems. And uh, really, it's difficult to assess uh, right now what is the level of governance uh, which is better to um, attempt uh, to solve these problems uh, in, a, uh, in a seemingly uh, sensible way. Uh, we run out of time. I really want to thank uh, Ambassador Formosa and Professor Petroni for this wonderful session. Uh, of course, the History Political Forum for being here and uh, organizing this wonderful conference uh, in spite uh, of very uh, difficult circumstances. Uh, but I shall conclude by uh, reading to you all a short message by, from our host, uh, João Carlos Espada. Uh, dear ambassador, dear friends, I would like to thank you very emphatically for this excellent Luigi Inaudi session. And we look forward to the next session in June next year, hopefully in person at the Estoril Palace Hotel. I think uh, I really uh, likewise hope we will have a chance uh, to meet in person uh, very soon. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Petroni. Uh, thanks to the organizers of this session and of the forum. Thank you.